Okay, so uh, welcome to this afternoon's session. And uh, we, as with the others, we have an interesting lineup. The first speaker is uh, Peter Rosenthal uh, from the Francis Crick Institute in London. Uh, I've known Peter for a very long time, about 21 years. Uh, and when I first met him, he was at the LMB working with Richard uh, when he published quite an influential paper on validation of uh, cryo-EM when it was still in the blobology stage. And, um, but he's had a long-standing interest going back from his graduate school uh, with Don Wiley on uh, viral fusion and how uh, uh, that works. So today he's going to be telling us uh, a bit about his recent work uh, using primarily tomography, is that right? And um, he'll also tell us what this picture means. I've been sort of wondering about this uh, for quite some time. Uh, thanks to colleagues and friends in the UK and Israel for uh, invitation to this fantastic meeting, and I guess I will sleep on the plane. So, when I heard the fantastic title, Fabric of, of life, I immediately thought of this cover uh, from Soraya de Chateauvarian's book about post-war uh, molecular biology. And there, the uh, beautiful periodic patterns coming out of crystals, perhaps Patterson's, uh, were put onto uh, uh, carpets and uh, curtains. And uh, I guess what's happened since then is that the fabric is not so periodic anymore. <laughs> And this, uh, this um, lithograph of Escher on the right is, is called contrast, um, uh, quite appropriately, because now we can still look at these beautiful symmetric objects, and I will show some of them, but it also seems we can get structures from any flotsam or jetsam <laughs> that you can get onto a microscope. Okay. Okay. I hope that was worth a minute of time. Anyway, <laughs> so, so yes, I'm going to uh, uh, talk about this uh, uh, interest, as thank you described, in of uh, influenza virus entry, and that's mainly how does how does uh, uh, protein mediate membrane fusion, and uh, one of the themes there is imaging dynamic events by by cryomicroscopy, and. I'm also going to tell a story uh, about um, a structure of an endogenous retrovirus capsid assembly. And that was an opportunity to study retrovirus capsids at very high resolution. But what's interesting about endogenous retroviruses is, is that they're, they're in our genomes. In fact, they, they constitute about 8% of the junk in the genome. Now, my, the session chair once said to me <laughs> that if it's not harmful, you shouldn't necessarily bother to clean up. Um, but in fact, um, it's even more significant that this junk has been used as an uh, engine for evolution. So our methods will include both uh, single particle analysis, and this is a famous beta gal galactosidus image, and along with the uh, prediction that 10,000 particles would be good enough for high, uh, high resolution, and uh, that, that number is probably uh, lower now. Richard may, may tell us about that. But um, if you're not so fortunate as to have identical objects to uh, average, then uh, tomography is really your only choice to get all the views of the object. And I'm going to go through the tilt series here of a cellular specimen, and you can see over the course of it there's been a significant amount of bubbling, which is the radiation damage, which limits the uh, resolution of the tomogram unless you can uh, average the objects uh, within it. And I, uh, of course, the reason we study uh, flu is clear. And of course, you know, when you're greeted at the airport with people with wearing masks, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a reminder of how serious this can be. So influenza uh, enters the cell oops, using the uh, hemagglutinin. Um, and the hemagglutinin binds uh, cell surface receptors containing the carbohydrate sialic acid, receptor binding domain at the top. 
And the top of the molecule is very variable, somewhat less variable at the bottom, which contains uh, what's thought to be uh, uh, the fusion machinery. And that's the trimer. And these were uh, crystal structures of the ectodomain. And then there's also a, um, uh, a molecule on the surface, the neuraminase, that cleaves uh, cell surface receptors. But I, uh, so far, I'm leaving the carbohydrates to Gideon today. <laughs> the, um, so this is uh, what the data looks like for, from the tomogram. That's the tilt series. And I think the mine can see a, a lot in there already. Uh, and then the reconstruction is simply uh, 3D volumes that show the uh, glycoprotein layer, the, the inside of the particle uh, containing the uh, ribonucleoprotein uh, uh, packages of, of the segmented genome. And we also uh, often make use of a, um, a, a strain that keeps a filamentous morphology while passage in the laboratory called the, the Udorn strain. That's why you get these uh, uh, longer filaments. There you can see a genome packaged at one end. So the uh, uh, anatomy of the virus is here on the left, the, uh, the hemagglutinin covering most of it. Often the neuraminidase occurs at patches at one end. And there's the uh, RNPs. And on a view from a different virion down the pipe, you can see the beautiful assembly of the eight uh, uh, segments, um, which are pack packaged together. So uh, potentially, you can use cryoEM to study uh, many steps in the virus uh, cycle, um, including uh, attachment, uh, potentially assembly. Um, I'm going to uh, concentrate most on this uh, event that happens in the um, endosome, where the low pH of the endosome causes a conformational change in the hemagglutinin, and that change mediates the fusion of membrane, and the virus can uh, 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 contents and can enter the cytoplasm. So, what's been known for a long time, and of course, this is a famous story that that everyone knows about the, um, uh, which comes from crystallography, that if we consider the, um, the neutral pH form of the ectodomain, um, and then we, we uh, drop that to low pH and then remove the floppy bits, you get a structure which has been called the, the low pH form. So the, if we, if we look at a monomer, the, the, the monomer uh, consists of two disulfide-linked units, HA1 and HA2. HA1 contains the receptor binding site, and HA2 is anchored in the membrane. And that cleavage exposes a fusion peptide, and that p potentiates the, uh, the fusion event. And the fusion peptide is down here. And it was always thought that the fusion peptide has to go into the uh, target membrane. So, uh, at, so this crystal structure by um, uh, Below and co-workers um, uh, gave an idea about that. So the, the, the floppy bits following low pH were removed, and you were left with the uh, primarily coiled coil extension from the end terminus here, which might be headed toward the target membrane, could bring the fusion peptide that way. But then there was also a... Uh, 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 sort of a jackknife event where the C terminus was brought into co-location with the N terminus. Um, and of course, that's the monomer picture, but that's the uh, trimeric uh, uh, version. And so the, uh, so the model of fusion that came then from uh, uh, in this review in 2000 by Scale and Wiley, uh, the idea that the and initially, there would be an extension toward the target membrane, bringing the fusion peptide there. And then perhaps subsequently, there would be the uh, foldback, which would bring the membranes together and to, to, to mediate membrane fusion. And the, uh, the other parts of the protein that were not in the crystal structure were presumed to be mobile and, and, and removed. So one of the first ways we wanted to study this process was to see it happen uh, in um, uh, in solution by uh, running the reaction and freezing it. And this, this is work that's been driven by Leslie Calder in my laboratory. So the idea is you mix liposomes and the, uh, and the virus, lower the pH 
to, to five. Um, and then at various intervals, we could neutralize and then uh, make our grids um, uh, plunge freeze and, 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 and see the state. So here we have uh, incubations of one minute, five minutes, 30 minutes. And then these are uh, 2D images, but we wanted to then look at uh, tomograms. And this is a slice of a tomogram after one minute. And you can see that the, uh, the virus particles are interacting. There are some changes going on with the liposomes, but uh, it, this, in this image, it hasn't progressed too far. This is one much further along, 30 minutes uh, at pH 5. And this is a liposome that has received uh, fusion events by three viruses, which I have um, uh, shown in the, in the uh, white hatch marks here. In each of those cases, we think a virus has gone in because we can uh, see the number of the RNPs. And you can see the viral membrane is sort of left on the backside here with the, with the glycoproteins. This dense matrix layer inside the um, virus has also peeled off as the RNPs uh, uh, disperse. Um, but then you can see uh, that many things are happening at once. Here we have a virus that is first uh, interacting with this liposome and perturbing the target membrane. Uh, there's an, another um, virus uh, um, uh, uh, perturbing a target vesicle, making a dimple out of an observation first made by uh, uh, K.K. Lee. Um, and then there's also uh, bits of interesting protein architecture at points where uh, membranes are touching. Here's a hemifusion diaphragm with an interesting little knob at the end. So uh, anyway, so we can capture uh, 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 quite a few events in, in, in one image. Uh, but nevertheless, if we, um, if we this is uh, uh, some numbers produced from considering a, a large number of just 2D images, you can see that after incubating from 1, 5 to 30, the whole population moves from a category of the HA liposome contacts to membrane membrane contacts and then to, to full fusion. So, uh, so we, we can make the re reaction progress, even though we're uh, freezing it in, in by cryo-EM. Uh, this is an example of uh, what we call a fusion pore in the section of a tomogram, where we can see a sort of a clear tunnel between the vesicle and, and the virus. There is one that has um, uh, uh, two fusion pores. So, of course, the uh, really interesting question is how the uh, HA protein structural changes, which we uh, uh, know about from um, uh, many experiments, are coupled to the membrane transformations. And what we, what we uh, see is that initially there seems to be just engagement with the glycoproteins, and in some cases, we can see extended lines running between the virus and, and the liposome. Uh, here is something closer to the uh, membrane contact in that dimpled form that I was uh, talking about. At, at many places of membrane contact, we also see uh, rather dense uh, bars um, surrounding the points of contact, which we think uh, looks a lot like the... So the dimensions of that and their thickness looks quite a bit like the this uh, uh, fold-back low pH uh, crystal structure. So, the, the, uh, so what we see in our tomograms is consistent with this uh, uh, hemagglutinin-mediated contact. We think that the HA going into the target membrane must be the thing that dimples it. Um, and then uh, ev eventually that, that, that fuses, and the, uh, we find the uh, fold-backs around the around the, the neck uh, of these events. Um, so th so I, I think that, it, it, you know, in initially this extended thing would have to be in the two membranes, and then probably when there's a contact, it has a path for folding into this, into this fold-back form. Of course, uh, what we were missing in the, in the crystal structures has been all the transmembrane regions that tell you how the, um, uh, how the protein is coupled to the membrane. Um, all of this is, uh, is a bit reminiscent of, uh, of, the, of, of snare type fusions. In that case, you have uh, sort of flexi flexible molecules in different membranes, and when they zipper up, uh, uh, some of the EMs I've seen show these uh, such structures around the neck, and then 
then a membrane fusion can occur. Um, so, so these are the ideas that there is the neutral uh, pH form anchored in the membrane. Uh, this is the low pH form in the absence of a, a target it will insert into the virus own membrane, and this is uh, uh, something we can see. And then these extended lines would be these uh, uh, putative uh, extended intermediate. This one was made just by extending the coiled coil um, uh, just on one end according to the low pH structure and leaving the membrane proximal region intact. And this just would reflect the propensity for a long helix that was first uh, noticed by uh, Ward and Dofidi and, and uh, uh, also studied in peptide experiments by, by Carr and Kim. So uh, I think for all of these, we want to see them in, at higher resolution. So, um, so, and I think there are ways to do that by tomography, but uh, um, now I'm going to discuss how we study some of these steps by a single particle analysis. Um, and the goal initially is that we have the neutral pH with the transmembrane segment of unknown structure, and that probably plays a role in membrane fusion, also uh, in assembly. And this was work uh, um, done by uh, postdoc Donald Benton, along with John Scale and Steve Gamblin, and we also uh, should recognize uh, uh, other people. Andrea Nons is our microscope manager who uh, uh, really is, is doing a great job. I mentioned Leslie for the experiments, and I'll mention some of the other people in a moment. Also, thanks to uh, Davida Corti, who provided a uh, um, monoclonal antibody that recognizes the stem region. The interest of those molecules that, that these are um, broadly neutralizing antibodies that recognize the invariant part of the hemagglutinin um, and would therefore uh, something that could uh, uh, block a number, of, a number of different flu strains. So when the, when the protein is, is solubilized in detergent, we get these nice uh, classums here where you can see the, uh, um, the micelle containing, containing the transmembrane region. Um, and if we uh, align the ectodomains in a similar view, we can see that amongst the classes are the micelles in a, in a range of different orientations, suggesting that that uh, Anchor is flexible, and that's of course uh, is uh, is a difficulty for um, a structure determination. But of course, all of the uh, programs now rely on um, uh, CryoSpark and System. All, all um, you know help uh, help us uh, find the solution to these problems. And then these are also two D images where the fab has been has been uh, added to the molecule. So if we ignore that flexible bit, we can get a nice structure for the ectodomain, um, uh, which you know, is comparable to uh, the, some of the resolutions that we would get by crystallographic studies. And uh, here you can see the uh, antibody at the bottom, and the back end of it is a, is a little bit flexible. And um, uh, uh, this slide I uh, dedicate to Gideon. Um, because, of course, the, uh, really the, the carbohydrate sticking off the molecule is really quite um, beautifully ordered. So the, the notion that all of it would need to be removed for a crystallographic experiment is, you know, is something we might consider again, as, as with other disordered uh, regions. Okay, to address the, um, uh, the structure of the transmembrane region, Donald took this uh, uh, approach of subtracting the signal for the ectodomain and then concentrating uh, uh, classification on these structures. And you can see uh, features uh, uh, beginning to, uh, uh, to emerge. And uh, he did produce um, uh, the best structure came from this um, uh, one where the antibody was at the bottom. And we think that that it actually limited the swing of the, of the TM, and that, that might have helped a bit. We, we have sort of angles for all of the different uh, classes. And if you look into the, um, uh, into the micelle there, you can see the uh, transmembrane region. It seems to go up until a point, 
and then it seems to uh, spread out a bit. And if you look uh, 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 orthogonal to that direction, you can see the three uh, transmembrane uh, segments, and you can actually see that it's shaping the micelle uh, around it. So, um, Um, and we th we think that that uh, we we were able to uh, um, identify some of the bulky uh, side chain positions here, and we think that this goes up really up until this um, uh, glycine in the in the middle of the transmembrane region, and then after that, um, uh, it's some, something something happens to it. But uh, also, uh, we we observe that th that the that the linker region is flexible from from the different structures that we calculated, and this was one of the next best structures was one where the ectodomain was uh, tilted at by 52 degrees uh, relative to the uh, the um, trimer axis in the uh, uh, in the micelle. So. Uh, and but, you know, it, perhaps it was adventitious context that made that stick. But anyway, indicative of the, the flexibility. And then my uh, student, Jack Turner, uh, uh, showed that if he put the HA uh, full back into liposomes, that, that they were actually all very, uh, very flexible. So it seems to be true in, in membranes in addition to, uh, to detergent. So the, um, the conclusions on these full-length HA studies is that there are the short, flexible linkers. We think that those, those linkers would be very important in allowing this uh, conformational change uh, uh, because the, the, uh, uh, the alpha helical segments actually have to uh, uh, get right perpendicular to the, uh, to the membranes. Um, and in addition, some of the, I think some of these uh, dense bars that I was mentioning uh, in, in the tomograms also seem to be lying almost parallel to the membrane. So we think that flexibility on the transmembrane side must be, must be important. And uh, <clears throat> so the, you know, the final step in fusion would be to have these, both the fusion peptide and the uh, transmembranes then co-located -lo co together. So uh, the, the next uh, uh, um, uh, big achievement from Donald, uh, again, this is work uh, done with Steve Gamblin and, and John Scales laboratory, laboratories, is, is to um, actually study the low pH transition, in this case using the ectodomain. So, uh, th this is a structure derived from the ectodomain uh, uh, by, by single particle analysis. And uh, what, what Donald did was he um, incubated the, uh, the glycoprotein at pH 5 for various times and then plunge, uh, was able to plunge freeze them. And um, he actually came up with a number of intermediates. And uh, what I'm just showing here is this uh, very dramatic one where you can see that there is this uh, long central helices uh, extending out the top. So that's the, so uh, this does look like the extended intermediate that we've been expecting uh, to see uh, for a long time. But what's also interesting is that the, the, um, the, uh, the HA1s have opened up, allowing that to go through. In fact, the first thing that we see are the HA1s uh, uh, separating. And also very dramatic uh, is, is the way this uh, sort of waste of the molecule holds together. So the, the, the HA1 contains the receptor binding domain, but then there's this uh, polypeptide uh, uh, N-terminal to it. And that, and that sort of stays put. It undergoes some, some we think, some uh, specific motions. But uh, that, that holds its, it clamped. And we, th we think that 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 is probably the thing that allows that thing to happen before the subsequent change, so that these, these loops are positioned uh, just around the point where the um, a jackknife would occur. So we, th so we think that um, uh, uh, 
Uh, this explains uh, uh, quite a bit about, about, um, about how it works. And that's, I guess, um, that was when Dan Donald left the microscope room and the computing room and saw, and saw a rainbow. So, and it, it is possible also, uh, but at lower resolution, to see this uh, fullback species uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the data. Okay, that's it for flu for the moment. I, I, I wanted to um, uh, talk about this, um, our interest in uh, retroviral capsid structure. Of course, one of the ones that's been uh, studied extensively is HIV. And in particular, it, it's known that there is, that, that following the initial formation of an immature uh, virion, which is uh, lipid enveloped, the uh, the associated GAG protein, which is a polyprotein, undergoes, um, uh, is, is proteolized to make separate proteins, and one of the um, uh, products is the capsid. It's a two-domain protein, and that forms a, uh, I guess that's my email here, that's, um, uh, in, so that forms an, a capsid assembly which packages the genome and in HIV, uh, that's very uh, famously uh, a cone, and I think the, the cone has made it um, a, a, a difficult object to get the uh, uh, structure of. Some of the first structural work was done by uh, Sam Lee and Wes, with Wes Sundquist, uh, working with uh, John Finch at the OMB, where they assembled the capsid protein in high salt and you can see all these tubular forms, which they were able to uh, study at low resolution to get the hexagonal, um, uh, a he hexagonal structure of the capsid protein. Uh, <clears throat> and actually, from, uh, from this, I thought we knew all we needed to know about this protein, but some of my colleagues uh, persuaded me otherwise. The, 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 the interesting thing about these uh, conical structures is that you can't get them from these uh, flat hexagonal lattices. And the idea uh, proposed there was that the, these cones, or these closed structures, have to have uh, what's called a fullerene geometry, where in addition to these hexagonal patterns, um, you get uh, pentameric forms of the, of the protein, which are defects in the lattice and cause it to, uh, to fold over. And you need 12 such uh, pentamers to close, up, to close up the object. And, um, and so um, th this is a computational model based upon some uh, uh, crystal structures uh, obtained by uh, disulfide linking the, uh, the protein to make the pentamer and the hexamer. And then this was assembled computationally. Now, um, so. Uh, when we began these studies, the thing we were interested in is to be able to see how the single protein can form a pentamer, hexamer, and, uh, and these associations. Now, uh, progress has been made uh, on this problem uh, by Patron Zhang, John Briggs, and others by using subtomogram uh, averaging. Of course, these uh, cones are generally never uh, all identical, so, uh, so, so those, those approaches apply. Anyway, we, we started looking at some other uh, virus families. And um, one in particular we looked at was the beta retroviruses, for which there, uh, there actually isn't a virus that infects humans, but there are these um, endogenous uh, viruses in the genome. Um, and we, 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 we uh, had some success with one called uh, HML2, or uh, it's H-E-O-R-B-K. So this is one of the, uh, so there are many ancient ones that have, uh, have uh, brought many of the important um, mammalian genes, but th this is a much more recent one um, that probably entered within the last million years, and many of them maintain uh, intact open reading frames in the genome. And you can get provirus expression associated with uh, disease, cancer, HIV infection. Its full implications are, aren't completely understood. Um, 
but you can reconstitute the virus particles and uh, they uh, process proteolytically and, and are infectious. Um, and here you can see uh, from two such studies uh, uh, particle formation. Anyway, so we were generally interested in how do the structures of these endogenous captured uh, relate to the uh, exogenous viruses that, that, that have been studied otherwise. And this is work with, uh, by a, a student uh, Oliver Acton, Tim Grant, who was in my lab, also uh, worked on that a bit. And it's been a close collaboration with uh, Ian, Ian Taylor's uh, laboratory, also at the, at the Crick. Um, so when you uh, uh, apply high salt to this, you, you get a, a wide range of, of, uh, of nearly spherical species. There are actually a lot of different species here, but we thought actually being able to study the species diversity would be, would be interesting. And um, uh, uh, this is the, a T equals 1 assembly, uh, which, we, which, we, which was the, the highest resolution structure at about 2.7 angstroms. Um, and this consists of just the 12 um, uh, pentamers, and it's the smallest, the smallest object. Uh, and let's see. Um, so the capsid protein uh, looks like other uh, well, ca capsid proteins from other retroviruses having this helical N terminal domain and the C terminal domain, and then a linker that is flexible or can take different paths. This was the uh, EM density for the, for the linker uh, fr from that structure. Uh, but we also had the help of the interpretation uh, that uh, Ian's group had done X-ray structures of the N-terminal domain and also an NMR structure of the uh, uh, C-terminal domain, including uh, establishing the dimer interface. And there's the uh, dimer interface, not from the NMR structure, but from the T equals, T equals 1 structure. So this C-terminal domain, shown in blue, forms an inner cage. They make these dimer contacts. And then you can see the NTD is, forms these uh, separate pentameric units on top of it. The, the NTDs don't touch each other. It's all the, the um, that is, separate pentamers, uh, NTDs don't, don't interact. It's all via the CTDs. And you can see it's similar to, for example, HIV or uh, uh, RSV in, in general design, but there, there are different quaternary uh, uh, arrangements. But the, the CTD arrangement, the inner cage, is, is actually is highly similar in these cases. So one of the other species we found was a um, D5 uh, structure, which is like the T equals uh, 1, which has pentamers at the poles, but then it's stretched, and there's a uh, equatorial band of hexamers inserted. Of course, they are actually located at twofold axes, axes, so they're perturbed from the from the hexameric structures. And here you can see how the T equals one fits um, right into the uh, uh, into the into the D five structure. So it's really just a so, you know, slight difference in the uh, curvature or angle of interaction here, which, which closes it off. Um, so we had, in, in the end, f uh, four species. We also have a D6 assembly. That has a polar hexamer. Um, and so that allowed us to, uh, ha having a perfect polar six-fold he hexamer, we could compare the structure of the pentamer and the hexamer, and you can see that a, um, uh, it's basically just a small tilt of it uh, or of, the, of, the, of the, the monomer allows uh, at a larger radius to incorporate an additional uh, monomer. There are very, um, really just uh, what we call sparse polar contacts between the, the NTDs. Most of the, oh, and I can just, uh, Show the uh, the relationship between between the, those structures. Oops, um, but if if we look at the um, so the important contacts are between the uh, CTD of a monomer and the adjacent NTD. So that's the that's what uh, glues these these symmetrons together, and actually it's just a very small uh, bonding adjustment, uh, uh, so it's like a light shearing of the bond. 
orientations, and in some cases their identity, which uh, allows it to uh, to adopt this uh, the same satisfactory solution to to, to making the the object. So now. Uh, uh, a, a bit more interesting is this T plus three assembly, uh, which has um, um, uh, hexamer, hexamer interactions, and pentamers. Um, uh, the, it, it turns out the, the the pentamers are invariant across all of these uh, these structures. So the the challenge for the uh, um, and this is the classic problem of a. Uh, Quasi equivalence is how does the uh, T3 hexamer make contacts with the adjacent hexamer and with the and with the pentamer, and of course these T3 hexamers are actually located at icosahedral um, threefolds, and it's just that sort of um, uh, 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 breaking of the symmetry. Um, that uh, creates oops, the slightly different environments for the hexamer and hexamer. So in other words, the, when it becomes threefold, it's, they're now interacting with the adjacent subunits uh, between pairs that are different. And when we, when we look at the detailed structures of those different pairs, we see that when the um, the hexamer is interacting with a pentamer. Actually, that's um, uh, I think I went the wrong way. Yes, that was this was the oh, when the when the T three hexamer is interacting with a pentamer, the configuration resembles what we saw in the pentamer. When, the, uh, when this pair is interacting with another hexamer, it actually resembles uh, the, the hex hexameric form. So in some sense, the molecule just has one structural switch that it does when it goes from five to six, and it's that same uh, uh, type of deviation is what solves the uh, interaction with the different environments. Um, uh, there's just one other, uh, um, I, I guess, detail to understand these things is that um, in the uh, in in the T3 form again, when it's interacting with a uh, pentamer, it must the 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 interaction point goes up, and when it's interacting with the hexamer, it goes down. So it turns out that the, all the pentamers are raised at a little bit of higher height than all around. So, so that's the, sort of the prescription for making the uh, shell. But of course, when you have these symmetric objects, it's the CTDs that are uh, are um, are bringing them together, and the. Um, the, the great extent, extent of bonding interaction for them with closely aligned helices we observe in the, in the NMR structure. And then the, uh, those, those interactions between the, 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 the helices that are making contact are, um, are now at a much higher angle in the T equals one structure, but they still uh, have enough uh, hydrophobic content as well as uh, polar interactions preserved to stay together. And, so we, we can look at all of the CTD, CTD interactions in this structure. And one of the things we notice is that they will have uh, these much different crossing angles, as I explained, for the, between the NMR and the, uh, and the pentamers in the T equals 1 structure. Uh, but then we also were able to analyze the hexamers interacting with pentamers and, and hexamers interacting with hexamers, not just for these species, but for, for all of them. And in that analysis, we found we could parameterize things by the, that crossing angle as well as the displacement. And that they all sort of segregated into these different groups, which we think are the basic rules by which uh, a hexamer has to approach either a hexamer or a pentamer uh, to make these, uh, these, these, these shells. So for example, that group is exclusively where the hexamer-hexamer type interactions happen. Okay, so the summary uh, uh, 
for, for the retroviral structure is then that uh, we have these four different types. We think there's a, a sort of a toggling between the C NTD and CTD interactions that rearranges pentamers to hexamers. The, in the T equal three particles, the six folds adopt the three fold symmetry. And it's really this, we think, the same structural remodeling that switches pentamer to hexamer is also exploited in this adapting to the local environment. And of course, it's then the specific crossing angles that make the, uh, the CTDs interact. And so I, um, I mostly thank people uh, uh, as I went along, just uh, also thank some uh, work in this area also done by some present members of my lab, some people who have contributed and left. Uh, we work closely with the structural biology uh, platform uh, 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 run by Phil Walker. I mentioned Andrea Nans, who uh, looks after our cryoses, and Andy Perkis, who helps with computing, and these uh, the uh, Gamblin and Scale uh, uh, collaboration, the World Influenza Center, and then the uh, workers at Humabs who, were, who provided that, that antibody. And then happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you so much, Peter. That was really beautiful. I'm, um, I'm curious about the work you did on the um, pH influence structural changes using tomography with Donald Benton. And you showed a series of structures, and you talked about how the HA1s are being separated. Mm -hmm. And But these were time points uh, where you took cryo... So, um, so my question is about the variability within each time point. If you if you were able to look at confirmation changes and get a feeling for the yeah. t time progression of this these structural changes. Yes, it's 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 relatively new, so I I don't have the you know all, all the full story and slides. But the but uh, it's an excellent question, which is that at any given time point you see a number of different species. So. Uh, uh, for example, after uh, uh, five or ten seconds, it will still largely be the neutral pH form, and then, but the the, um, the this extended intermediate will be visible for for many tens of seconds. So, if one looked at a statistical analysis yeah. of those states, wouldn't that yeah. give you some insight? Uh, yes. So yes. So there is so there is a uh, there is a progression, and that's why. Um, uh, we think that the, the first steps are an opening up, um, and then after many long time points, it's in that, it, it can go into that, that final low, low pH thing. It, it's just that the, anyway, so the, um, <clears throat> yeah, so we think that progression is there, you know, how time resolved it is, given the difficulties of the experiment is the only you know, hesitation. Um, so, different question, but on the same slide. Um, so, I'm intrigued by this belt that you mentioned around uh, the uh, intermediate extended form of HA2, yes. and also the uh, retention of HA1 uh, during the extended form. Do you think that the belt could be a timing mechanism for the next step, and that you have to yeah. wait until you have a couple um, that are making a pore before it, it actually brings the membranes together? Um, I haven't thought of it in terms of the uh, pore, but I, I do think of it as the first step has to be the extended thing, and that if it went directly into what has been uh, called the pH effusion uh, uh, structure, it, it wouldn't be reaching the, the target. And certainly this mechanism uh, where they would be in different membranes and then brought together makes sense to, um, uh, to separate them. So that, yeah, so what you described is, I would say, the way we, we would like to think about it. Very nice, Peter. So from your tomograph, can you actually tell how many trimers are there in order for a defective fusion to happen? Um, uh, yes. It's usually what we would call the, um, uh, it's the slightly sort of um, naked direction of the tomogram where the, where the missing wedge is at its um, uh, most awful. But, for example, we can see, looking in those directions, we see 
Well, we, we think something like six to eight can fit in there, and we see striations around those pores. There you can see it adjacent, and in the perpendicular direction, there's a, a double double pore where we where we see those things. But we, you know, we, so uh, so I think it helps us think about how many can fit in there. I think we need better resolution to uh, to know. Mm -hmm. <coughs> One last question. In the fusion experiment, um, I wonder if there is any specificity to lipids, to a kind of lipids, okay. or any. No, but well, we have used a um, uh, what we would call a plasma membrane uh, uh, mimic, and we we do know that that in some other uh, uh, mixes that we haven't done, but some other labs have done. Uh, you seem to get many more of these uh, hemifusion uh, diaphragms, extended hemifusion diaphragms. Um, and uh, so when we think that those are probably non-productive things, but so, so in other words, there has been some ex exploration in the field of that uh, parameter, but uh, um, anyway, we chose that one, and, and uh, that, that's what we've used in our experiments. So. Okay, well, thank okay, you very yep. much. Yep.